in the back garden. All of it. Plates, cups, bowls, saucers, the lot. Why, you may ask? Well, I want to explain why. I'm a writer, so I've turned the why into a story. That's what writers do, we're annoying like that. Why I planted my wedding delf in the back garden has so many narrative elements. Romance, conflict, maybe even a moral at the end. But I'm not here to preach a sermon or teach prescriptive life lessons. I want to explain the why to myself more than you. Writers, we're selfish creatures. So sit back, be loose, and uh, look at some waves up there, and I'll begin. Like all good stories, this starts as a tale of romance, the big kind. Two, uh, well, a marriage starting out, shiny and new. Two kids pretending to be grown-ups, so in love with each other, we had that goofy reflection in each other's eyes. You both see the best possible version of yourselves it's possible to see. My fiancé Simon and I went to the fanciest shops and spent ages choosing the perfect wedding delf. We decided plain was best because pattern might get too tired. We settled gleefully on a beautiful set of porcelain white and then probably went home to have amazing sex. But it wasn't just that. This was love. Simon and I believed in magic, the deep kind. Two souls who are just so delighted to be in each other's company, they feel like better people. The world is more colorful. You're an invincible superhero, destined for happy ever after because you've never felt so happy. Nothing can touch magic people like that. Nothing. Except it could. Our perfect elf, so full of possibilities, began gathering dust in a fine-looking dresser, another wedding present. It gathered dust for 10 whole years. Maybe all Delph starts out this way, a bit like all marriages. So many hopes, so much promise, then babies come along, priorities change, and you don't even remember your own name. You're not exactly planning, come dine with me soirees. The Delph didn't get used because of little people at first, and then it just never got used at all. Four years into our marriage, during the chaos of two small boys and another on the way, my husband Simon was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. He was given three years to live. Water break. <laughs> Crystal glasses got dustier. Family gatherings didn't require fancy plates. We didn't gather that often, and anyway, Simon couldn't actually eat. The Delph began to annoy me. It weighed heavy on my soul. The dresser and I began avoiding eye contact. <laughs> Sometimes I fantasized about smashing it all against the back wall. I was angry. When the anger lessened with the years, I knew I still had to do something with that delf, because my soul was agitated. Wedding delf required a soulful move. So, one day, I decided to plant all the wedding stuff in the back garden. Was my dresser becoming unhinged? Well, no. <laughs> I leaped from the couch one night quite spontaneously, and began planting in a gentle frenzy, running back and forth from dresser to garden, sticking plates in the ground with the lightest touch. I worked head down at first, and then stood back to survey my handiwork. I gasped 
aware that I had created something quite beautiful, like some sort of art installation. Call it contemplate. <laughs> Plates like large moons glinting in the half-light. Crystal goblets delicately upturned in the earth like flowers. I had thought about doing it. I had written about doing it. On this day, I didn't want to write about things anymore. Things needed doing. I took my sensible son out the next day to take a look. He looked at my eager face and nodded sagely, knowing, feeling somewhere quite deeply, that something about this might be considered wrong. So he showed my mother-in-law while I was out. Naturally, she was quite upset. Your mother shouldn't have done that, she whispered, shaking her head. My son told me she had said this. We have never actually talked about the night of the Garden Delph because it would have turned into drama. Wedding Delph was not planted for drama. I want to explain to my mother-in-law that there was no badness in what I did, quite the opposite. No Delph was harmed in the making of my back garden. One glass got a tiny bit cracked the next day, but that was it. No broken pottery at all. I didn't do it to hurt anyone or look for attention. It wasn't a cry for help. The act of planting was all the help I needed. Afterwards, I felt remarkably calm and free. My own mother arrived the next day and took it all away in big plastic crates. She, <laughs> she put it under the bed in her house, muttering that I might want it back one day. No, I won't, I replied quite firmly, knowing that I really wouldn't. Things are just things, my granny used to say, but we attach such importance to them. The wedding delf was hurting me, and once it was planted in the back garden, once the dresser was empty, I was unburdened from all those wedding wishes that never came true. Since then, Simon, my husband, has, um, has died. He was set free from a body that didn't work anymore. We miss him. Uh, I still live in the same house with my five children. The wedding delf never came back. It's still under my mother's bed. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to leave it there. Uh, I did buy a new dresser, though. <laughs> Two years before Simon died and ever since, I've become a bit of a mermaid, one of those all-year-round sea swimmers. <laughs> we dive into the cold Irish Sea every day. It's salty, it's freezing. It helps me cope because it makes me feel alive. I wrote a book about sea swimming, and people seem to like it. Uh, for me, the writing comes from the same place as the garden installation. It's never contrived. I, I, I planted the delf just for myself, not to hurt anyone, just for me. In the same way, uh, I write for myself, not for anyone else. I'm pretty selfish that way. Uh, I'm talking to myself the entire time. It's as raw as I can be, and you get nothing less than my entire soul. <laughs> Uh, a few months before Simon died, I started collecting sea pottery at the cove where I swim. Ladies' Cove in Greystones, County Wicklow, may look like a grey stony beach from afar, but look a little closer, you see colour. Sea glass shines on the shore. Blues, greens, pinks, and then you have the sea pottery. Fragments of delf, often with patterns on them that have been thrown around in the sea for a very long time. I'm going to find pottery, I say to my son when we visit the cove. He nods, knowing it's true. 
30 seconds later, the first piece flashes hello from the shore. A blue ripple of a piece, a patterned tiny vignette, rounded by the waves, most beautiful. Beside it, a long, exquisite shard of white sea glass, and two paces later, a delicate green leaf on white. Tiny cracks branch like tributary veins. I laugh out loud. <laughs> Magic is real, I tell my son, the sensible guy. And he nods because he knows it's real and that it's right here. I stroll on drizzly beaches and I find treasure. My feet follow their own path over scattered gems and pebbles. I follow them like the yellow brick road. <laughs> sea uh, pottery is my new obsession and has possibly turned me into a bit of a weirdo. I see signs in the intricate pottery patterns, solve deep mysteries among the cracks and grooves. Each piece to me is nothing less than pure magic. I get this strange strength from sea pottery. These tiny fragments used to be dinner or side plates, soup bowls or teacups. They could have been somebody's wedding delf not just the boring plain kind. The sea has shaped them into something else, and the patterns never grow tired. Often they take my breath away. My husband died and love was lost, but I still have that staunch, stubborn belief in magic, like it's worth pursuing, worth trying, Worth every goddamn risk of human existence. It's worth it to me. Um, my sea pottery collection proves it. And my writing, maybe. Who knows for sure? Life is so uncertain, but that's the real magic. The sea is a mighty, beautiful, stunning, shadowy, nebulous shapeshifter. You can never fully trust the sea, our only certainty. Wave after wave, thrown around in the surf, broken things are at its mercy. Edges blur, original patterns fade, always some new detail to reveal in delicate relief. The more time I spend in the sea, I know it's reshaping me as well. <laughs> Throw me around then. <laughs> Turn me into a battered chunk of blue willow. Wouldn't that be nice? I planted my wedding delf in the back garden to feel free. Now I spend my time collecting random fragments thrown up by the sea. <laughs> this is the part where I start comparing myself to a piece of sea pottery. Moral of the story bit. I'm not preaching pottery, maybe, but <laughs> when I hold fragments in my hand standing by the sea, I tell myself, let yourself break. It hurts way more trying to hold on to perfect wedding delf. Life throws you around and it hurts. Let life reshape you. Let go. This is what I tell myself. I'm not telling you what to do. <laughs> Maybe you'd rather have perfect wedding delf. Steer clear of silly writers and their pottery metaphors. <laughs> Me, I'd rather be a fragment in the sea. Broken, cracked, battered by the waves, wild, worn down, but not destroyed. Continually molded into something else. Into what? I don't know. It's a bit wrecked looking, but it's some sort of beautiful. That's my story. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Um, it's not a perfect story, and I hope not. I don't look for perfect anymore. I'm too busy looking closely, scavenging for small 
fragments of color.